Devil's Club? Oh yeah, it's thorned, sharp. It literally doesn't have any surface that doesn't have purple thorns on it. Yeah, it'd be nasty if it had fallen to. Yeah. So the thing is, I wouldn't normally wear Birkenstocks, but it's over 70 degrees and, well, I just wanted something to kick on. And I've seen a guy skiing without legs, so I figured it's okay. I can just go a little slower and still get the sweat-inducing activity of climbing a steep trail as uh, an alternative to walking on flatter ground, which doesn't get my heart pumping as much. So, so yeah, you, you can hike in sandals. People in many third world countries only have sandals. So you don't have to wear Nike's latest fitness shoes or New Balance or whatever, you know, $100 plus pair of engineered polymer shoes to go on a trail. I mean, you could technically run barefoot, but there's lots of sharp, um, like wood debris and rocks so barefoot might not be the best for this kind of trail. Uh, it might hurt your feet, especially if your skin hasn't toughened and you're not adapted to walking barefoot outside. But have a look at the beautiful biome here in wide angle. This is the Pacific Northwest in Western Washington. And this is an undeveloped natural part of a forest ecosystem in an upper alpine environment. And that's what you're looking at here. We're maybe 700 feet elevation above sea level and you can see lichen and moss growing on the trees really spectacular with the sunlight coming through here you can see the lichen it's almost a bright vivid neon green color being lit up by the sun like that and um, as the sun filters through the forest here you can see these beautiful colors um, it produces tons of oxygen since the trees bring it breathe in co2 and photosynthesis accomplishes converting CO2 into sugars for the plants and the trees. And then they exhale O2. So when you're hiking on a trail like this on a sunny day, it actually supercharges your brain and vascular system with a little bit of supplemental oxygen. Um, or it helps to fully saturate and oxygenate your body while you're climbing where your heart and lungs are working a little harder. Uh, to ascend on foot. And this is the difference between walking and hiking is the steepness of the trail. Hiking generally encompasses going through a steep forest trail where walking can be accomplished on any kind of topographic terrain. And hiking is generally through paths in the forest. This is significant because if you go back in early human history, humans originated in forests around Ethiopia, what is modern day Ethiopia, at least as far as the phylogenetic genetic evidence suggests, not to say anyone has absolute knowledge of that. So we're entering an upper clearing zone here, and this is where the forest canopy gives way to more exposed ground. And what you'll see is better perfusion of light through the canopy, and it'll appear quite a bit brighter. And what this does is it gives the understory a chance to compete against the taller trees. Is that taller, heavier trees don't do as well uh, at higher altitudes. And it has to do with a lot of factors like lack of water, uh, the windswept environment, topography, lack of soil, um, overabundance of rocks, and 
a little harder for the root network. Although you can see right here, this tree is having no difficulty uh, putting a, a deep root network to support that canopy there. In a small kind of way, hiking trails like this reminds me of being a Boy Scout. We did a lot of upper alpine trail hiking in Troop 633 when I was a child. And uh, it's good for your brain because it increases blood flow. So when you get your heart pumping to climb, you know, vert vertically varied topographies like a mountain trail, um, it increases the ejection fraction of your heart and perfusion of blood through your capillaries, which strengthens all the little tiny veins in the peripheral tissue in your fingers and your toes and prevents neuropathy, um, ulcers, like, un like diabetic foot ulcers and stuff that really hurt many people with metabolic syndrome diseases cancers and unresolved diabetes or unregulated high blood sugars and then um, the increased breathing rate and better oxygen access in the forest also supports much greater cognitive or executive function so literally forests are good for people's brains and their bodies and hiking is great for their cardiovascular system so there's it ends kind of soon after you go that way. Oh, does it? Yeah. yeah. It's four right it turns to just, get to the top. It just kind of dead ends that way. Okay. If you take, I'm going to do a slow pan here. Just take a look at how beautiful the forest is. I'm going to elevate the view a little because you can see the trail at the bottom of the image. And they even have signs like that to help orient you with the Google Maps. That's Miss Meg. She's my hiking buddy. She's actually the reason that we are hiking today. I wasn't feeling as well and wanted to sit around like an American. So Meg encouraged me to, to get out. And what a beautiful day. It's like 73 degrees, maybe a little cooler up here because we're at a higher elevation. And you can see just the Beautiful. Now I'm gonna pan up to the canopy like this. <laughs> you can see the forest canopy. This is something really worth stopping and appreciating because a lot of people never look up like this. And this is the beauty and splendor of the forest that really has an almost poetic, stochastic, chaotic, fractal pattern to it that isn't exactly part of the Mandelbrot series, but could be. Depends on which tree, they're all different. This is an upper alpine lake. So where there's impermeable clay in the soil, you see water pool up like this. And this provides insects and birds an opportunity. So I'm gonna squeak in here a little closer so you can take a look. So mosquitoes love to reproduce in, in stagnant water like this, but you can tell the optical clarity is good. So this is fresh mountain spring water that runs off the hill and it's pooling up in this. You can see the clay under the surface of the water really clearly actually. So, oops, slipped there. You can see that's a clay. So that's saturated clay soils have very low water permeability. And if you watch the surface of the water, you can actually see the insect activity. So a lot of flying insects actually nest in the surface of the water. And when they're young, first take flight, they break through the surface. And so you'll see quite a bit of mosquito-like activity in these stagnant pools. And this is generally unsafe to drink because it's got fecal coliform and bird poop and all kinds of other stuff in it. So if you're gonna drink water like that, you have to suck it through a life straw or some kind of reverse osmosis filtering system that allows the water molecules to go through a semi-permeable membrane 
and then active carbon filter um, to clean it up if it's for to drink. Make notice the precise little hole in the ground right here. So sometimes snakes or insects make holes in the ground like that and their nest is under there like this. This is called a craggle trail. So where this, this is called craggle here within big rocks and tree roots and such. Now most of it's pretty smooth, just, you know, pine needles and, and dirt, but there's tree roots like this. They, uh, you gotta watch out. Like I said, I'm walking in sandals. Now be careful when you're going downhill. I'm gonna give you a warning. This is a helpful warning because when you're, ca when you're walking, you're catching a fall. So if you watch Meg's gait here very carefully, when you walk, you lift and pivot and fall and your body's catching your fall. Well, when you're going downhill, you get additional accelerating forces. So instead of just five times your body weight hitting your knee and ankle, it can be 10 or 15 times your body weight. So if like me, your torso weighs around 100 pounds, um, you're talking about 750 to 1,000 pounds of pressure on the knees and ankles. And that's a lot of weight for a skeletal joint, a synovial joint that's cycling to get impact damage from. So be very cautious when you're, when you're going down the hill to, to, take a, to take it at a reasonable pace, especially if you haven't exercised going fast down a trail recently you want to take it easy when you're first improving your fitness especially if you've been sedentary for a few years and you inspired by this video decide to go hike a trail i would highly recommend stretching before and after so you don't cause muscle cramps and if you do experience muscle cramping potassium and magnesium are your friend um as you can get them as supplement forms. But um, what they do, the electrolytes, um, is they, they cause the nervous system to stop contracting the muscles, which is what causes a muscle cramp in the first place. And so if you find that you have muscle cramping, uh, taking magnesium is a good idea. The only time that would be a bad idea is if you're dehydrated and have kidney stones or something. Because taking alkaline salts increases the formation of kidney stones. So I would recommend mixing lime or lemon juice into your water if you're going to be taking magnesium for a muscle cramp. And besides the citrate, if it interacts with magnesium forming magnesium citrate, that just increases the solubility and diffusion coefficient of the magnesium ion, which is what you're going for in the body anyways. Almost all the metals in the human body, including the calcium and sodium in particular, are moving around as sodium plus or calcium plus as ions, not as metals. There is no metallic metal in the human body. It's always ions, or it's mixed with chloride or tartrate or citrate or something. Biomolecules often have, like co cobalt, for example, which is a deadly toxin to the human body, is the central metal ion in the B vitamins, for example. And some of the micronutrients like chromium, um, picrate, those are poisonous at anything higher than a few micrograms. To, to say this another way, the human body contains 126 different elements from the periodic table of elements. So we're, we're literally like the entire chemistry set and then there's over a hundred billion microbes in our gut flora. So, and then there's actually more bacteria cells in the gut than there are cells in the human body. So I'm not just talking about our skin flora, our butthole flora, our colon flora, our eye or nasal flora. I'm talking about everything, the whole human biota floral network. You're basically a walking ecosystem with an acid mantle on your skin. And this is not widely known, and it's at the bleeding edge of medicine right now. And it, there are a number of possible therapeutic pathways to treat diseases by adjusting the microbiota balance, the flora of the gut, is the whole reason probiotics are a product. It's the whole reason that fermented foods are healthy. It's the whole reason that eating more dietary fiber is important. 
if you track a lot of healthy nutritional and lifestyle things, the reason they're so good for us is because they improve the health of the flora in our body or the ecosystem of the human body. And so a lot of the things that are toxic for the ecosystem, the environment, like pesticides, insecticide, herbicide, and fungicide, well, they're toxic to the friendly microbes in our body too. And that's why those things are poisonous. If you study the toxicology of why fungicide, insecticide, herbicide, and those industrial chemicals sprayed on food crops are bad for the human body, it's because the same reason they kill the pests that eat the crops. So some of the microbes in our flora get damaged. And that includes GMO, where they've, in, where they've genetically included the pesticide into the flesh of the produce, or the meat, or the dairy. Because then you can't wash it off, you can't peel it off. It's not something where it's easy, it's, it's integrated in the product. So it's kind of like a peanut soaked in glyphosate. Nobody, with the exclusion of people with rare genetic disorder, which are a tiny pop part of the population, are actually allergic to peanuts. So the peanut allergy is actually caused by glyphosate poisoning. Because peanuts are a legume that's grown in the ground. They're not, in a, they're not an above ground tree nut like almonds. And so when they spray herbicide uh, Roundup on the peanut crops... Uh, it soaks into the soil and the membrane husk around a peanut is highly permeable to glyphosate. More than that, it's, uh, the peanut is like a root network, so it's sucking up the nutrients and so the, the So the fruit. peanut, Meg's saying that the peanut itself, because it's like a node or a nodule in a root, it's actually sucking up the chemical poisons they spray from the soil. And I got to say this too, industrial agriculture, monocrops, and all of the rest of it to make cheap food in the breadbasket of America that caused the green revolution when the human population increased from 2 billion to 6 billion. Well, that intensive agriculture has caused soil levels to decline 60 or 80 feet vertically in the Midwest because of senseless above ground water irrigation. Oh, they're also not putting... They didn't put wood chips... Or compost. They're not putting compost back in. They don't put any compost back in because yeah. compost was make soil. Traditionally composted the soil back into it. They they used to compost more and they rotated yeah. crops and they did the crop rotation to fix nitrogen instead of using synthetic anhydrous ammonia or other fertilizers that made from crude oil. So a lot of the modern green revolution that caused human population to increase was actually powered by petrochemical fertilizer and petrochemical pesticide, insecticide, herbicide, and fungicide. So a lot of those industrial chemicals made by BASF and Bayer and Monsanto, those companies aren't intrinsically evil. It's only evil when they do things that knowingly hurt other people just to maximize profit. That's what makes it evil. They're knowingly hurting other people, sickening the environment. Well, the environment is filled with people, other people's children and grandchildren. So... When they knowingly release neonicotinoids, and they, they know the neonicotinoids are toxic to bees, and then their lawyers, lawyers publish reports saying it's not bee toxic, that, that dishonest lying is called sleaze, or immorality, or it's unethical, or evil, because that's what's causing the colony collapse disorder and killing bee colonies. I mean, it's so bad that the bee colonies are 50% of what they used to be just 10 years ago. So this is a systemic problem. And it's a whack-a-mole problem too because industry patents these molecules. So let's say one pesticide A gets banned by the EU and then the US, EPA. Well, their chemical engineering department will make an analog that's totally unique. And then they'll patent that with a new trade name, Zephulon 5 or whatever. And they t change one teeny functional group on it, and it's just as toxic or poisonous or more or less, and it's just as bad for the bees and other pollinator in insects. And then they get away with selling it for another 10 years before they figure out that that itself is toxic to the lymph nodes of the human body and the endocrine system and the brain and nervous system.
You wanna see how toxic these chemicals are? Go to the hardware store. Go to Lowe's or Home Depot or McLennan's and go to the lawn and garden department to the herbicide, fungicide, insecticide uh, section and read the warning labels on the packages and see what it says. Don't just listen to me. Meg's pointing out that dogs and pets and uh, dogs and cats which lick their paws, they walk around in people's yards where people people, are their pets. people spray my parents used to put castor on 2G or 4G, I forget, as a herbicide all over their yard so they wouldn't have to pay landscapers to do additional weeding. And it was banned from the hardware store, so they bought it from an agricultural supply that shall remain unnamed because I like the business, but it's for, um, they banned it because it's exceedingly toxic to aqu aqu uh, aquatic wildlife in rivers, streams, lakes, oceans, you know, where fish are commercially important, for example, like in the Northwest where salmon is a huge industry. Well, Casseron may be effective at preventing weeds from growing in your yard, but that's another example of an externality where you as the homeowner putting that in your yard to prevent weeds probably have no idea that that's causing harm to nature and it's up to the legislative regulatory bodies and the government to protect consumers from hurting each other because your freedom ends where my nose begins and we can't assume that everyone's educated as a college level toxicological scientist with ecology knowledge and you can't put the onus of responsibility on random housewives and children to understand stuff like that so what Meg was saying is that a lot of pets end up with cancer because they, their parents spray artificial perfume, scents, fragrance products around the house. Well, those are poisonous. Read the MSDS for the, the stuff that people spray around their house. In fact, Amazon, on that note, Amazon can tell when a woman is pregnant because she starts ordering scent-free, dye-free, fragrance-free products four months before she does a pregnancy test. So they can... Um, they can tell when a woman is like only been pregnant for about two weeks because the human female body goes into a hypersensitivity mode where smells become more intense. And so women naturally want to switch over to dye-free, scent-free products immediately as soon as they conceive when the gamete fusion starts and when the oocyte starts embedding into their uterus. They, their body immediately goes into a chemical protective mode to protect the developing human body in its early developmental stages because anything that goes wrong early on causes catastrophic mental retardation or um, developmental delay or rare genetic disorders or medical problems uh, down the road. So the body, in order to protect the human offspring or the developing babies, during the early fetus development, the human female's body is incredibly chemically sensitive. And that's another reason that pollution and fungicide, herbicide, pesticide, and insecticide should be tightly regulated and we and or banned in most instances. And they should start using biodynamic pest management strategies, crop rotation. You know, there's a farmer on YouTube that proves that if you put down wood chips, compost, and mushroom soil on plants, it makes the plants so strong they're naturally disease and pest resistant. Okay, so. Joel Salatin. There's many authors uh, who have published about this and the omnivore's dilemma. And there's a number of Silent Spring by Rachel Carson. Um, it's Ecology is the newest in the sciences of the mainstream sciences. Ecology is the newest. So it took until the third industrial revolution before we started to understand about the idea that mine drainage will kill the lake and the birds in the lake. So like there's people that are paid to shoot birds away from lakes that are contaminated with acid mine. Well, they scare them away with, they use a propane cannon and all kinds of artificial crows and stuff. And they're, you know, your uncle Ned style guy with a truck that wants to go out there and the Bureau of Land and Reclamation actually pays them. Yeah, it's in rural America where there's mines that are 100 years old that are long ago bankrupt and left in disrepair. But the problem behind not, not remediating a mine site after the done with the commercial operations is that it rains and water gets into those operations. And because of the nature of breaking the, the chemistry of rocks, when you fracture them, 
um, it forms acids. Now this is different than when, when mushrooms break down soil and erosion products. It's a slow, gradual process and there's buffers and, and there's, there's biological buffering mechanisms when nature does that slowly over geological timescales. I'm talking about when humans move in with diesel equipment and electric motors and big, huge mining okay. gear, coal powered gear back in the 1800s. And they start mowing down hilltops for coal and doing that kind of thing. Well, when rainwater gets into that, it forms acid mine drainage. And acid mine drainage is toxic for an environment like this, this beautiful, pristine forest. And this actually used to be a coal mine through here more than a hundred years ago. There's an area in Bellevue and Newcastle called Coal Creek which up until the 1950s was used as a coal mining and logging operation. So, but they remediated, um, there's just a few rail sections and rail cars left now as historical mementos along the trails there. Um, and they, 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 um, they filled in the, the mine openings and backfilled and concrete filled uh, the mine shafts mostly to prevent the public from being injured, splunkering through that, not understanding that there's toxic gases and dusts and hazards. And so it's, it's not um, safe for random members of the public to go into an abandoned mining shaft, obviously for, I mean, just think about it for a second. Um, unless they're experts at splunkering with gas monitoring equipment and, you know, respiratory protection. Well, there's one cool side effect. So there's this group, and I forget their name, but they make these beautiful pigments. I think they're called earth pigments, but they're they're made of acid mine drainage, and they're um, they're like rust colors. Like there's like an amber, a maroon, and a purple, and they're all kind of a dark shade. Um, Meg found a geode made of quartz. So these are quartzite. Um, Sometimes they're lightly radioactive, so we'll bring that back and hit it with the Geiger counter. Um, quartzite sometimes contains a little thoria or uranium. Um, usually they're they're bright or dark black. The other one that you, if you're looking for a radioactive rock, you're looking for pitch blend or really dark black rocks. I mean, really the only way is to drag the Geiger counter out and check the rocks because there's so. I'm not a geologist, but. I can tell from going to United Nuclear's website and looking at different ore samples and stuff that generally speaking, granite is a, a good, if you want a weak radioactive source, uh, granite rocks and quartzite are two uh, good ones. And then uh, the really radioactive stuff that forms, it's from much deeper in the ground and they tend to have a really dark black appearance. Um, and not all dark black rocks are radioactive. Again, you have to test them. I've seen probably 300 different rock types in the trail here while we're walking across it, more even than that. And so there's lots of repeating igneous and sedimentary limestone and field spar and other different like common rocks. Like here's a, here's a geode line, like a big one. These um, originally, actually, a lot of these rounded ones started in a river, and we're, we're pretty far up, which, you know, plate tectonics and Meg pointed this out, Pan, 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 Pangea was actually a supercontinent because the plates are drifting. So the Earth's tectonic plates are constantly moving. It's in centimeters per year. And you can, the orthogonal projection of a, a map of the continents can be rearranged very easily visually like a, like a Sudoku puzzle or like a, like a geometric puzzle. And you can see that everything fits together and that it obviously used to be connected. And then over, you know, millennia uh, or millions or billions of years, the continents drifted apart to the current configuration but that's a lot of earthquakes and tsunamis and natural hazards and disasters are actually uh, because the earth is constantly in a state of movement. This is why I talk about chaos and entropy. That's, um, that's Lake Sammamish down there, if you can, you can see it through the trees here. And this is the part where everyone and their brother in Western Washington wants to live near here. 
So a standard single family home is like more than 600,000 and often over a million dollars. Especially the ones immediately adjacent to the shoreline of this lake, they're well over a million. And the, <clears throat> I got it on good authority from a guy who used to live on Lake Sammamish in the Issaquah part, that his property taxes were over $30,000 a year for 100 feet of waterfront. And he actually ended up selling that house for over 2.5 million and moving to Maple Valley because his children grew up, got married and moved out. And then him and his wife decided that it was just senseless for the two of them to live in a large house like that when the operating cost, even though they had it paid for, just kept going up. And they of course didn't pay 2.5 million for it. They were able to sell it because the housing prices nearby are horridly inflated. Stupid, is the word. Stupid. Everyone we talked to, including people who were realtors or are realtors, older people, working people, and everyone in between, described the local housing prices as ridiculous, insane, out of control, mental, stupid, um, outrageous. They use all of these different adjectives to describe that it's basically a ripoff. Because if, if you're paying $6,000 a month, that's $200 a day, right? And is it worth $200 a day to have a bathroom, a kitchen, a garage, and a place to sleep? I mean, ask yourself, if a large swath of Americans can buy homes for one hundred and sixty to 300000 why would you pay $2 million for the same thing just to be close to Microsoft? Well, the answer is Microsoft has a lot of high paying jobs that are being taken actively by software based AI. And I have a good chuckle about this, too, because it was widely thought that robots would take away white collar or blue collar manufacturing jobs like the robots that weld cars together at GM. But it turns out that legal services jobs, software engineering, information technology, if you look at chat GPT, one, two, three, and four. Go ahead, I study AI as a hobby. Artificial intelligence is gonna take away all the information jobs first. So a lot of these upper middle class snobs that live near us that are overpaying for the housing are gonna be out of work and forced to move back to India or to California or wherever they came from. And they're gonna have to sell their house at a price that's lower because the market's already lost more than 100,000 in value. Homes that were selling for 850 are selling for 750 or 725 now. There's a ton of homes that have been on market for 221 days with no offer. So it's definitely converted from a seller's market with multiple offers into a buyer's market. It's turned from a bear market to a bull market or a bull market to a bear market. I forget the terminology and get it backwards, but pretty much the price pressure is dropping. And with recently announced layoffs from Amazon, Nvidia, Google, Microsoft, uh, those are big tech company employers nearby, Boeing, as they keep laying off their information technology or IT staff, a lot of the housing nearby goes up for sale. And we've seen a meteoric spike in the number of rental properties. And the rental property, single family home renting prices are going from 3,400 a month down to 3,000 or 2,900 or 2,800. And of course, our stupid anthology ground level apartment with a garage attached is currently 3,200 a month, but it ends up costing me $3,508.86 by the time I pay the common area maintenance fee. Well, the base rent's going from 3,200 to 3,600. So if I tack on $300, we might as well call that $4,000 a month. And that lease ends the last day of July. So we're not renewing. And I actually have to give them the notice to vacate at the beginning of July, 21 days ahead of time. So yeah, I don't, I don't believe in spending uh, $48,000 a year to rent an apartment. That's just stupid. And even if I had billions of dollars, it's just stupid to overpay for housing. And that gets back to our general theme. People that want to live within 10 miles of Lake Washington, it's insane to overpay for housing. There's no rational justification for it. Other than chasing the Joneses or zip code envy 
or some kind of obsessive, materialistic, greed, shallow, or vain thinking that's actually nonsensical and unwise if you think about it. Now, I'm going to say this. A home is not an asset. Let me say this again. A home, like a, like a stick-built, on-property home with land, that's not an asset. That's a liability. It can catch fire. An earthquake can knock it down. A pipe can break and flood. The electrical system can get short out and cause a fire. The furnace is about to go out. The stove's about to go out. The fridge is about to go out. It's going to need new windows. The siding's failing. The roof is failing. The gutters are failing. There's subduction in the land and the pipe broke. Now the sewage is backing up into the toilets. And this actually happened to my parents. So homes are a liability. Wealthy people, when they're talking about assets, they're talking about businesses that turn a profit, like a high dividend yield stock, where you holding shares in a company pays you a quarterly dividend or passive income. That's what pe people don't understand. How can someone make $50,000 a day in America? How do these billionaires make $50,000 a day? Well, they do that. They hold 45,000 shares of Amazon at $1,400 a share, like that. Or they, they, they hold hundreds of thousands of shares of Procter & Gamble or ExxonMobil or something that pay, or nursing home investment funds or something. And these high dividend income stocks and bonds and mutual funds, what they're doing is when I talked about Revel, the exploitative nearby within walking distance to our overpriced apartment, 55 plus adult home when they charge five thousand five hundred to nine thousand dollars a month for a one-bedroom apartment what they're doing is they're extricating or stealing family wealth from people who worked their entire life who paid their taxes and i don't like the irs either because they extort the middle class only 93 million americans incidentally pay income tax and there's over 430 million people in america what the hell is that about ask yourself that is it fair that we make one quarter of the population pay all the income tax? Because President Biden is publicly saying that billionaires should pay their fair share. Well, what about the other 300 million people? Why aren't they paying income tax? They couldn't all be below the poverty line or old enough where they don't have to file, right? So what kind of scam is that? Meg and I, on a very meager income, had to pay an additional 6200 in income tax after my employer legally forcefully took money out of my paycheck for Social Security, Medicare, and Medicaid, of which I believe I will never collect any of those benefits. So ask yourself, if you're an American watching this, are you being fairly represented in the Congress or Senate? Do you feel like you have representation in government? Or is Coca-Cola getting more representation than you? And if so, why are you forced to pay for the military industrial budget? The government spends nine tenths of its national debt time to enjoy our hike in this topic. on nuclear aircraft carriers and bombs and munitions. And when we teach children in Sunday school not to hit each other, why can't we behave like that as countries? Why do we have to have these crazy military budgets? Why don't we? build better roadways and power infrastructure and invest in education and healthcare instead. I mean, America could be a utopia like Norway, right? We could, we could build, we could effectively make more Americans upper middle class in terms of lifestyle benefits. But instead, go to the U.S. National Debt Clock website and look at what these illegitimate morons in government are voting for and how they're spending your tax money and your future children's tax money because they're spending money they don't have and they're increasing the national debt. And that's part of the reason the U.S. dollar is inflating or losing value. Inflation means the U.S. dollar is losing value. Inflation means the dollar is losing value. I hate to summarize it like that, but that's what it means. It means $100 this year will be worth less next year and so on. And so you're, if you're holding your money in a bank that only pays 2% interest, you're actually losing money. It's like you're paying a hidden tax in a way. And this is another way that the rich people who own the banks are cheating you and you don't understand probably, but they're cheating everybody. They're cheating most working normal people. You know, the guy who collects your trash, the plumber, the accountant, the tax 
the person who files your taxes, the people who do the landscape maintenance, the, the road workers, the people who manufacture stuff, the people who work on the line, the people who are doing the actual labor, who are cleaning, organizing, shipping, distributing, truckers, honest working people. I'm talking about union members, people who actually have a job. I drive a school bus. I have a job. I drive other people's children to and from school. Meg has a job. She helps a doctor who works 70 hours a week with two special needs children because she's divorced from their quasi-useless ex-husband. And I'm not naming anyone's name, but there's a lot of dads who don't deserve the title father or daddy who neglect their children. And that's pretty sad too. And I see it as a bus driver. Well, not wanting to leave on a, a negative note, I want to remind you something. The word forgiveness. I want you to focus on forgiving yourself of anything that you've done wrong right now. And if you join me and say, Father God, I ask for your forgiveness and I accept your forgiveness for these sins that I've committed. And I endeavor with your help, Father, to stop habitually sinning and to become more excellent in all ways. And then I want you, I want you to look up repentance and the eight R's and, um, What's the name of that place in Georgia, Meg? I want you to look up Be in Health Ministries and read about the spiritual roots of diseases in Dr. Henry Wright's book, A More Excellent Way. Or there's a condensed, smaller version, The Spiritual Roots of Diseases. It's blue. And if you read those, you'll understand what I'm talking about. Even in, even in the atheist medicine right now, it's called the mind-body connection. So if you do thankfulness, appreciation, and gratitude exercises, it's actually healing to your, men your mind, your body, and your emotions and your will. And you'll feel better when you focus on things you enjoy and things that you like. So I even do this with the children on my bus. I want you to first take into your mind, close your eyes, and focus on the word appreciation. What do you appreciate? It could be a song, a color, a flavor, a favorite person, someone you love, some place that you've been. It could be your car, your motorcycle, your bicycle, a pair of shoes. It can be the food that you're about to eat or something that you really like to drink. It can be your favorite dessert, your favorite dinner, your favorite breakfast or lunch item. The point is to be intentional, to think with your eyes closed about five or ten things that you genuinely appreciate that give you something to look forward to. Now the second activity I want you to do is called gratitude. You're going to close your eyes, you're going to take a deep breath in through your nose and hold it for four seconds, then you're going to breathe out for four seconds, and then you're going to hold your breath for four seconds, then you're going to take a nice deep breath in for four seconds. This is called box breathing. And you're going to think about while you're doing that over and over again sitting in your home, not while you're driving. You're gonna think about gratitude. And it can be towards nature. It can be towards God or Christ Jesus. It can be to Muhammad or to the Wicca or whatever. I'm not telling you what to believe. I'm telling you to focus on being, gr having gratitude in your heart, being gracious towards others. Think about being grateful for the food that you have, the air that you have the soil, the earth, nature, reality, existence, that you exist, that there's other people that you get to interact with, there's things that you get to learn, there's new things you get to try, there's new places you get to go explore, there's fun activities, there's always something to do, there's a lot of novelty, there's always something nifty, there's always new innovation, there's something cool, okay, focus on what you're grateful for, you know, I'm I'm grateful to electric motor technology and even internal combustion engines, rotary and piston engines. And, you know, think about how Rotax has improved Bombardier engines and aircraft engines, right? Or Subaru's boxer engines or Toyota's really long life 2JZ inline six or, you know, the turbocharged two two liter four cylinder engines and 600 different models of cars sold worldwide right now. 
that's more fuel efficient, more powerful. Some of them even make 350 horsepower and 295 foot pounds of torque out of a two liter, you know, with 25 pounds of boost. Like the GR Yaris or the GR Corolla. Those are pretty cool. In fact, I would say if you're into motorsports and you want a car, the GR Yaris or GR Corolla are about your best value. The Subaru WRX is pretty cool too, but that's old school. Um, if you're into the latest stuff, that's about as close to an actual rally car, the GR Corolla, that you're going to be able to buy at a reasonable budget. If you're into electric cars, I highly recommend the Tesla Model 3 or the Nissan Leaf. Um, those are really cool. And they, even the Chevy Bolt that Chevy discontinued recently. Um, a lot of the newest stuff can go 250 miles per charge. And it costs just pennies per mile to operate an electric car. And let me say this, the lithium ion batteries will not be thrown away. No one is throwing away EV batteries. When they're done in the electric vehicle, they will be reused in solar energy storage and wind energy storage systems. And you can always buy a reclaimed battery from a, um, a Tesla Model 3 or a Nissan Leaf that was wrecked where, where the battery was okay. It's just other parts of the car were damaged. You can reclaim the used battery pack for one fifth to one eighth of the price of a new one. Now I want to say this about lithium too. So lithium prices in 2012 were around $4,000 a ton. And as of 2023, they're $78,000 a ton. So lithium prices have basically made it feasible to develop sodium ion batteries. And CATL, the world's largest battery manufacturer in China, is actively developing the second generation of sodium ion battery. And Polyjoule is developing an, a polymer, a electrically conductive polymer battery. And Tesla is developing a new lithium cobalt free battery based on nickel and manganese. So, and you're gonna see a lot of innovation in electric motors like the Raxial motor from Koenigsegg and the other Axial motors from Yamaha, NGK and Toyota, for example. Uh, Mercedes, BMW, Volkswagen Group, they're, they're all doing it. I mean, Volkswagen has more than 26 different electric vehicle platforms under development. That whole diesel gate thing propelled them deep into the electromotive space. And if you're interested in electromobility or transportation energy, I highly recommend this website called Green Car Congress. That's all one word, greencarcongress.com. Um, Autoblog Green is another one, A-U-T-O-B-L-O-G.com forward slash green, G-R-E-E-N. So those are the two websites I frequent, mostly, auto, mostly um, excuse me, Green Car Congress. I've been trolling that website for years. Uh, not, not in this traditional, I've been, I've been uh, a avidly reading it is what I meant by that. I don't troll any websites. Uh, I don't do any trolling. I, d I do comment on Quora, Q-U-O-R-A, Quora. It's an engineering site where people post questions so that engineers can answer. Well, since I'm a scientist, I answer stuff. Uh, usually before work, I wake up naturally around 4 a.m. So I go on there and answer questions people have about when should I change my motor oil and wire, stuff like that. I, I have a an unhealthy deep knowledge about engines because I've been obsessed with them since I was about five, five years of age. It started with the lawnmower at home and trying to understand how its little piston, carbureted piston engine works and taking it apart and putting it back together and then tearing it down all the way as a middle school student and putting it back together and changing the oil and cleaning the carb and learning about how stable makes the gasoline shelf life increase from two months to two years and why why you would use it in a gas can or in a small engine like for a generator or a pressure washer or a lawnmower or something with a small engine like an old motor air-cooled motorcycle for example or scooter or something you know or pre-2001 automobile that was never designed to use ethanol or e10 which is sold at most gas stations so sta-bil it's a red fluid and you add one fluid ounce to 2.5 gallons or 10 liters. And I do that in my safety gas can. It's got a pressure valve on the top that you press that distributes the gasoline very precisely down a tube so it makes it easier to fill a scooter or a motorcycle or generator tank or pressure washer tank. Um, any small fuel tank. I forget the brand, but it's, a, it's cool. There are modern 
gas cans that are so well sealed that the when the butane and propane start boiling out when you first press the button you actually hear the gas escaping as the temperature increases as the season goes from winter to summer and the gas can warms up in the garage like that so i'll leave you with these beautiful blue flowers blue purple it's a very rare color in nature in insects it indicates toxicity usually but terrestrial plant flowers are some they're called inflorescence they're some of the most beautiful phenomenon I've for years loved photographing flowers, so videos, just thousands of videos in a way, or photos, I mean, videos, just thousands of photos, so, and even, I'm going to do a, this is for you geology buffs, look at all the rocks on this trail, I mean, if you wanted to find a small rock sample for a home science project, you don't have to go far, just go to the local hiking trail and pry one up, right? Nobody's gonna care. There's billions of them. And you, even if you just wanna look at them, there's t that's the kind of, I wanna encourage you to just get out in nature and go look at stuff. There's so much beauty around you just waiting for you to shift your focus on. And shifting your focus on appreciating nature is one of the best ways to understand why being thoughtful and considerate is important. Because ultimately when you throw trash out the window, it ends up in nature. And being wasteful is actually stupid because it wastes money too. Wasting energy wastes money. Nobody actually wants to be wasteful. Sometimes people are just careless and break things. But you know, you don't wanna be foolish either. So as you grow up and become an adult and develop a small amount of wisdom, try to make intelligent lifestyle choices. Skip a meal and go hungry. It's actually good for your body. Eat more fiber, drink more water, stay active. The one thing I can tell you from interacting with tens of thousands of other people, the people who are 90 who are still out hiking these same trails that we're on, their trick was to just stay active. There's no special diet or nutritional supplement. Well, they probably also eat clean and healthy. You know, not a lot of candy, not a lot of desserts, more whole, natural, organic fruits and vegetables, meat, less like not crazy big meals, maybe an early smaller dinner, bigger lunch, stuff like that. They go to bed early, they wake up early naturally. They go for a walk all the time. They do yard work, they don't pay other people. They, you know, they chop the wood on their property. They pull the weeds, they mow the lawn. They, they drive to and from work. They actually go do something and it can be anything. There's thousands of kinds of jobs, but what I'm getting at is that, let's say you have a sedentary desk job, for example. One of the best things you can do during your off time or when you're not at work is go for a walk. And if you happen to live near a steep trail like the one we're hiking on, you get more bang for your buck per minute in terms of exercise or activity value. Or go to the gym. If, if nature is not your thing and you're not into hiking trails and making your sandals and your socks and your feet dusty or whatever, then go to the gym and hit the elliptical or the stationary bicycle. Or even better yet, go take your bicycle out of storage, pump up the tires and go for a bike ride. Pretend you're 10 years old, you know? That's the one thing I love about the motor scooter and the motorcycle. They actually remind me of being a little kid, being a fifth grader and tooling around on my bicycle. And since the weather's nice, I've been commuting to and from the bus hub because I work as a school bus driver. And I really love being a school bus driver, actually. It's my, of all the jobs I've worked, it's my favorite job. And I want to thank Meg, who's right in front of me here, because it was ultimately Meg who convinced me to be a bus driver. And it, it got me out of my unhealthy previous job. So if you, if you have an unhealthy job that's making you annoyed, change careers. You're not stuck in your car. You're not stuck in your job. You can always try something else. And I'll leave you with that. Hey, thanks for watching. See you next time. Cheers and warm, warm regards. Blessings from Meg and I to you. Bye-bye. Hey, before you go, I want to show you something that I appreciate. Do you see this warm? This is a freshly broken tree. Maybe, I don't know, storm, who knows. But um, 
before the wood has oxidized in gray, it has this beautiful amber color. And look at the bark too. It's got kind of a papery. When I was talking about appreciation and gratitude and thankfulness, I'm thankful for this lichen and moss right here, right? I'm thankful for the beautiful, look at the grain pattern. You know, look at the, look at the beautiful rings here. There's, look at the texture in the skin of the tree, the bark. Look at the layers in the bark too. Let's crop in here. Look at all these layers here. Look at this. There's so much detail in the majesty of nature. It's actually spectacular if you stop and look at it. Meg's uh, scoping rocks. She's got a rock hound kind of geology focus. She's looking for one as a gift for Pastor Dana and um, to wrap with copper wire. And I really like when you see, see this, the outside of this rock doesn't look like much, right? But look at the cool inside color and texture of that. Isn't that just beautiful? You can pick up you know, anything. Look at this one. So many different kinds of rocks. They all have a history too. Everything has a history. Here's some stinging nettle. It actually makes really good tea, but the um, the hairs have oxalic acid that'll sting if it gets in your skin. But, yeah, you can, you can see we're near the bottom of the trail here. That's Newport Way in Bellevue on the border of Issaquah, or in Issaquah on the border of Bellevue. That's, uh, that's Meg right there. And you can see the traffic through the trees there. These are really overpriced three-story condominiums just beyond the road there. And it's a pretty busy road. It's used as a, a major connector between thousands of houses in downtown Issaquah and South Bellevue. So we'll go, uh, we'll go super wide here like this. And uh, that's the base of the trail. Hey, once again, thanks for watching. Stay positive, optimistic. Think about things you look forward to. Forgive yourself, forgive other people. Think about what Christ Jesus was teaching his disciples about being a loving, kind person and try to emulate that because it'll make you feel better, I promise. Cheers, friends. Take care. Bye. Look at that tree. Look at the look at the moss growing all over this tree. Isn't this spectacular? I mean, it almost looks like some kind of decoration from a hippie house or something. It's just gorgeous. Look at that. Look at this tree. Isn't that amazing? It's another angle. Look at this. Thing. They put in a nice bridge over there. We walked across it earlier. It's pretty fancy. These are the overpriced condos I was talking about. They go for over a million dollars. 
their townhomes, excuse me. I don't think they're worth it personally. And they get a lot of road noise here. Because you can tell, watch, there's cars just all day long. Just constantly coming and going. So, it's a lot of a lot of street noise and I'd be kind of annoyed if I paid a million dollars for a townhome and had to endure listening to traffic 24 hours a day that kind of sucks but you know different strokes for different folks and other people don't hear as well so maybe for someone with extensive hearing damage that wouldn't be as bad I love these information graphics like this thing right here. It's like the, it's pretty goofy. Not sure what this infrastructure is. There's a brand, CalSense, and they've got an antenna. And it's a really expensive stainless cabinet system here. There's some clues, if you can comment to the effect of what you think that is. I have no idea. Meg likes to sniff flowers like this when we're out and about. Sometimes they smell really good. How about these, Meg? Kind of an um, evergreen-like smell. Here's a memorial. So sometimes someone is hit and killed on this roadway right here. And then people leave flowers and stuff behind for their loved one's memory. And um, I wanna uh, tell you something. If you're, uh, if you're out driving, try to be gracious and patient. You know, being a, an irritable driver with road rage, it doesn't really get you to your destination faster and it'll definitely stress you out and irritate and annoy you. And it doesn't have to be that way. You can just calm down. And if you're running late, leave earlier. You know, I, these people that are chronically late for work, just leave five minutes earlier. It's not complicated. This isn't rocket science. If you're always five minutes late, just leave five minutes earlier. In fact, I would recommend leaving half an hour earlier and showing up early because I consider being early on time, being on time late and being late unacceptable. You know, because I have a work ethic and I believe in actually showing up and doing what I'm supposed to and being there on time. And sometimes there's an accident or unforeseeable thing between where you live and where you're going to work. And you can't guard against, sometimes your 20 minute regular commute is gonna take 45 minutes. So, you know, wake up earlier and show up earlier. Be a, be a, be a leader. No matter if you're the lowest employee or at the top, lead by example. And, and combat against mediocrity. Mediocrity is boring and it sucks. You know, try to be exceptional. Aim higher. You'll only get further if you aim higher. Don't accept less. You know, try to aim for more. I'm not telling you to, to buy a bunch of stuff you don't need or to be arrogant or glib. I'm telling you to be exceptionally good at what you do, no matter what that is. Have a can-do attitude. Feel empowered to create positive change. You can make a difference. Everyone can make a difference, especially when we work together to solve problems. And that's the spirit of the international scientific community on the, at the South Pole and the International Space Station. When people work together on great things like the James Webb Space Telescope, amazing, amazing things can happen. And there's a deep green ecological change happening where you can buy organic milk at the grocery store and people are starting to embrace the better way. And you can, you can vote with your feet, but really you're voting with your wallet. Everything that you buy is a vote for something. So remember, when you're spending your money, every dollar you spend is a vote for something. Every dollar you spend is a vote for something. And so... Not only is frugality being wise, but it's also important to consider if you want something, what's it gonna do for you right now, next week, next month, next year? What is this thing gonna do for you five years down the road? 
how will it affect your future? Because if you don't think about stuff like that, you can fall into a trap that a lot of Americans end up in, where you're paying to rent storage units for stuff you're not using. And if, you can go ahead and ask me how I know, because that's what Meg and I are doing. And I want to encourage you to not do that. But um, I didn't know back then what I know now. And I'm trying to share condensed wisdom the way maybe a grandpa might share with his grandchildren. But I don't have children or grandchildren, so I'm sharing it with you if you happen to be watching this video. And I want you to go tell 10 other people the same thing, that save your money, being frugal is smart and wise. Don't buy stuff you don't actually really want. Think about what you really want, what's adding value to your life, your faith, your family, and your friendships. Don't just... Uh, needlessly buy a bunch of stuff you don't actually need or want or you'll end up with so much stuff you can't even keep track of all of it and I know all about that too so I'm I'm telling you to don't fail like I did learn from my mistake and make better choices and you'll do better than I did and I hope that for everybody actually I love watching other people succeed it's nice to see people thrive and that's why I like living around here there's a lot of successful people who are thriving it's nice to see people on the up and up, you know, making a, making something of their life. Think about that. Meg spotted this really pretty robin's egg here. A bird or a predatory animal probably got it. Or it might have fallen out of the nest.